In terms of today's event, what's it about? Um, it's designed for employers and it's designed to help employers build an inclusive workplace, particularly within the context of race and ethnicity. Um, and we have some fabulous speakers today uh, who are going to talk from an employer perspective in terms of how they um, have addressed the barriers to race inclusive inclusivity and also the mechanisms they've used to successfully build inclusivity, not always without challenges, of course. So our speakers will talk to you today. We have speakers from Dowd's Group, Sensata and Danska, um, and I'll introduce those speakers as we go through. We also have speakers from my own organization, a speaker, Roshin, who will talk about inclusivity and race from a legislative perspective. And then we have our colleague, Stephanie, from Business in the Community. And Stephanie's going to talk specifically about uh, the, the, the Race at Work Charter that's been developed by Business in the Community. So those are the broad speakers. Um, the ultimate aim of today, however, is not just to raise your awareness about race inclusivity, um, it's also to give you the experience of speakers, but it's also to um, allow you to use two new tools to produce or develop race inclusivity. Um, I'm briefly mention them now. Um, first of all, there's the Race at Work Charter from BITC, which Stephanie will talk about and which is available and can be signed up to. Second of all, from the Equality Commission perspective, we have our Race Equality Plan, which has just been finalised. And it will allow you to conduct an audit of your policies, practices and procedures to determine the extent to which you meet legislative requirements and good practice. So it's been developed. It will be available literally within 10 days. Um, and uh, we can speak to you a wee bit about that. And Roshan will briefly mention it as we go through. Um, so that's the background in terms of the speakers. We're going to begin with uh, our first speaker. And our first speaker is Gemma O'Kane from the Dowds Group. And uh, Gemma is going to talk about the journey of the Dowds Group so far, including consideration of signing up to the BITC Charter. Why this issue is a priority and what are the challenges that have been faced and are being faced by the Dowds Group? So I'm going to hand over to uh, Gemma. And uh, I should have mentioned as well that our speakers will be available uh, for the Q&A session. So if any questions come up as Gemma is speaking, have a note of them and then you can put them to us when we come to the Q&A session. So over to Gemma. Hi, um, morning everyone. I'm just going to share my screen here. I've got a couple of slides. Um, can, can everyone see that okay? Yeah, okay. Um, so I guess when uh, Stephanie first approached me about talking um, at this um, webinar today, I was sort of a bit um, on the fence about what I could add because we're quite new into our journey um, for race inclusivity. Um, so I guess I'm really here to kind of represent everybody else that's, that's sort of tuning in. And I'm hoping to learn as much today as you are as well. Um, so first of all, I'll start off just giving you a bit of background on Dowd's Group. We are a multidisciplinary construction company, so predominantly starting off with um, mechanical and electrical engineering, building services supply. Um, we also have a standalone construction division now, a facilities management division, and we've recently just started an energy solutions um, faction too. Uh, we have three offices currently headquartered in Balamoney here in Northern Ireland. Um, we have a satellite office in Belfast and a London office as well. So we have over 200 employees and about 500 supply chain members. Um, so what are our issues regarding race at work? Well, I'm sure everybody can relate to this at the minute, but um, recruitment is a massive challenge for everybody at the minute. Um, regardless of your size or industry, good people are hard to come by at the minute. Um, in terms of the, the level of people we employ, um, we're sort of a management company now, so we would be more from uh, site supervisor level up um, rather than labour um, and operatives. 
um, we work in Northern Ireland construction in particular, and it's a very traditional industry. So as well as maybe not being as inclusive as possible in terms of race, there's obviously a gender bias in our industry. Um, we have um, an age problem due to the physical nature of some of the work, as well as um, maybe not being as open and enticing to people um, of disability as well. And sexual orientation is also an issue in the industry at the minute. So as a company and as an industry and as a whole, we recognize that we could and should be doing more to try and address this. Um, so that's why we had thought about signing up to the Race at Work Charter through business in the community. Um, as a company, people are, are is one of our core pillars. Um, it's part of our five-year strategy that we are trying to be a more inclusive and diverse workforce. Um, we see the benefits of that. It, it gives you a bigger selection pool from which to, to gather the best people. Um, more diversity of thought, greater innovation, and ultimately that leads to a better bottom line. So um, it, it makes good business sense to be a more diverse employer. Uh, so why didn't we sign then? Um, we have the right intentions and we know that's, what, that's where we want to go as an employer, but I don't think we have enough sort of infrastructure in place yet. We don't have the right systems that will allow us to monitor performance or benchmark against peers as well. Um, we didn't want to sign the, the petition either just for vanity reasons so that we could have a nice social media post. Uh, we wanted to be able to back up what we were saying and I don't yet think we're at that point. And I guess because we're fairly new into this journey, we're not entirely sure where to go or you know how to how to start the journey. So hence the fact that I've been interested in joining this workshop today as a as a observer um, rather than a, or as well as a participant. So I'm looking forward to to hearing what everyone else has to say. So hopefully that's give you um, a bit of uh, background on on our journey so far and we look forward to any questions um, at the end. Thank you very much, uh, Gemma, for that contribution. Uh, we were particularly uh, interested in the fact that, Gen uh, that Gemma was going to be honest about the fact that um, the company have considered signing the charter and being proactive, but they didn't want it to be a vanity project. and. As we know, there are lots and lots of charters and things out there, some of which we are responsible for, and at time people can sign up, but there's no actual concrete work to underpin them. And sometimes actually signing up to charters, it's a negative because it gives the impression that people are doing things and they're not actually doing them. So um, that really important message from Gemma. And Gemma will be available for uh, the questions and answer session at the end. So thank you very much for that contribution, Gemma. Um, I'm delighted you could be here to, to give us the, uh, your experience of dealing with race. Um, we're going to move to our next speaker, uh, uh, who is from Sinsaza, and it's Adriana Morvaiova. And uh, Adriana is going to talk to us about the employee resource groups within Sinsaza the lessons that have been learned within the company, and very interestingly talk to us about the levels of the journey um, that Adriana and, the, and her company uh, have been working through. So um, again, just a reminder, if, you, if, if you're not speaking, can you please not share your camera? Uh, and I'll hand over now to Adriana. Wonderful, thank you very much, Paul. Um, I have a couple of slides myself, not too many. I uh, don't want to cause you deaf by PowerPoint, but <laughs> here we are. Let me just, uh, can you see my slides okay? Yes, Adriana. Awesome. So, um, since Alta Technologies, um, who we are and what we do. Um, let see if I can get that slide across there. So, since Alta Technologies is a global industrial company, um, we make millions of sensors, mission critical sensors that um, you can find anywhere between elevators, incubators, airplanes, um, trucks, trailers, heavy machinery, 
um, air cons, you name it, where all of our sensors are everywhere. Um, specifically, so Sensara is also has 21,000 employees across 13 locations. I am based in Northern Ireland. Um, our Northern Ireland site is historically known as Schrader Electronics, um, which has been acquired by Sensata Technologies in 2014. Um, in Northern Ireland, we make tire pressure sensors, which um, most of the cars now have. And you will know that you have one when that little annoying message appears on your dashboard saying low PSI. So that's us. Apologies for the water. I have that all the time myself. Um, but it saves, saves lives. And um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today, I have a couple of more slides about, I have a slide about our ERG um, evolution, employee resource groups. Um, just go pop into the next one. Um, my name, so Paul, thank you for the introduction. I am a diversity, equity and inclusion specialist for Sensata Technologies. I have been with the company, Shred Electronics and Sensata 16 years. I have started as in manufacturing and I worked uh, my way up to this, my, my current position as a DEI specialist within Sensata. I have been part of um, Sensata's DEI journey um, from 2016. So in the slide, you can see our very first um, affinity group. So we all started with affinity groups and then we matured into last year, but matured into employee resource groups. So we will talk about that a little bit, you know, that maturity model and where we are in our journey. But we have a number of different employee resource groups. Our very first one comes from, it's based in obviously in our headquarters in Attleboro, based outside Boston, um, AWI, which is called Attleboro Women's Initiative, which was created in 1989. <clears throat> After we have been acquired by Sensata in 2014, in the two, following the two years in 2016, we created our own women's initiative called GROW generating recognition and opportunities for women. Since other technologies, it's not just a technology industry, but also software and different types of engineers, mechanical engineers, verification engineers. It is a male dominated in industry. So we wanted to create a group for women and um, where they can receive support, extra training, um, mentorship, anything they needed. So we created GROW. And then following that, I was part of this group. I was part of the GROW group in 2016. At this stage, I was still, I was working as an engineer and administrator. In 2018, two years later, I am, so the reason why I created um, Appreciating Cultural Exchange ACE, which was our next employee resource group in, in Antrim specifically, because in Antrim, we have around 800 employees and 20% of those employees are from different cultures. We have 26 different nationalities based in Northern Ireland. That's including British and Irish. Um, so I knew that I wanted to create a group where we can have an exchange. We had employees moving into Northern Ireland to start a new life to work for the company. So. A key part of this was us helping them to integrate into the community. So they were asking questions about the local culture. What's it like to live here in Northern Ireland? What is the culture like? What is the food like? The music and everything. So I wanted to create an exchange where the people who are moving to Northern Ireland can learn about the local culture that will help them integrate and create a successful life. And also the local people, um, they were very interested in different cultures. So I wanted to create an environment, a safe space where people can learn from each other and learn about different cultures. In America that year, we also created our very first Hispanic um, association. We, and we have a large um, Latinx community. And then our journey continued in 2019. We created Sensata Emerging Professionals and so on and so on. We have other um, gender groups that support um, our female community. So we have one in the Netherlands, for example. We have two of them. We have in Mexico, two different ones. And um, we also um, needed to understand that um, just because we have a community, female community in Mexico, one of the lessons was we couldn't assume that they wanted to have one group. Even in, we needed to understand that 
there are differences between cultures within the same country. So what we learned that we needed to create two groups, two separate women's groups for Mexico because it's such a large, um, such a large coverage of ground and cultures. And because the two of them, the two facilities were too far away from each other, and there was some fundamental difference between, differences between the two cultures, it was more beneficial for us to have two different ones. So there was no cultural clashes. So we have two Mexican groups um, for women. Then we launched our um, official diversity strategy um, in 2018. Since that, we have further employee resource groups created. Um, September uh, 2019, we created our women's group in China. Then in March 2020, it was the second group um, that we created in, in Mexico. So between 2019 and 2020, there was that communication or that exchange happening between the different regions and different conversations. And that's where the decision has been made to create another one. And in May 2020, we created our Black Employee Network. Um, and then in this year, we launched our Pride Network and our AAPI Asian, Asian American and Pacific Islander groups. So these are our current existing groups. So <clears throat> the baseline, what we had, we had 12 different groups. But since that, we added three more, but not new ones. What we're doing is um, throughout the pandemic, we understood um, global connections. All of a sudden, we are in this virtual world. So we wanted to extend our networks. So since the pandemic and even in the new virtual world and new connections, the group that we created in Northern Ireland is, has been sort of replicated or recreated chapters in the Netherlands, and we are launching our Bulgarian chapter um, this week. So we're sort of extending our networks and also um, building stronger and bigger networks. And we creating this opportunity for people to, to network and create new connections and learn from different cultures through, through this group. And then we also launched, we created our Sense of Emerging Professionals in America. And this year we launched our chapter in China. So what we're doing now, we're not trying to create new groups. We're trying to um, extend our existing groups to new locations. So that's about our employee resource groups. And our employee resource groups lessons learned um, are made by, are created by our um, workforce. None of our diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives are led by HR. They are supported by HR fully, but they're all led by employees from the ground up. So all of the groups, it was people coming together and creating the agenda. That's why it took years for us to, for example, create our Pride Network, our LGBTQIA plus network, because it took time for people to build their confidence to build, uh, to build a journey and to build a network, to be able to come to the company and go, we're ready, we're ready to do this. Um, a lesson learned was we didn't want to do a tech box exercise by creating an, an affinity group or an employee resource group for each protected characteristic. So for example, we still don't have, we don't have a group that addresses age. We don't have a group that addresses different abilities. We don't have maybe a group that addresses caregivers or um, mothers or parenting. So we don't have those. But what we're trying to do is that anything that it's not covered by our employee resource groups is funneled back into our regional diversity, equity and inclusion councils. So, for example, neurodiversity is something we don't have an employee resource group for. Therefore, we created a neurodiversity um, series. Um, of different workshops, which were then delivered by our DEI councils. So we have regional councils. We have one in America, in Europe, in uh, Mexico, and Asia. So we have four of those. Um, and then to the point of the journey that Paul talked about, so um, maturity model. So it's nice to be able to, to check in on our journeys. Every company has their own journey, and it was lovely to hear from Gemma um, that they're starting their journey and it was lovely to hear and her being very transparent about these are the challenges we have and we don't know where to go for the answers. 
So <clears throat> Sensata, we're, still, we're on our journey too. So this is where we are at. We're sort of in an intermediate level, I think. Um, and we started somewhere and journey continues and we're learning along the way. And so many lessons to be had. And we love meeting up and learning from other companies. Like we have Danske Bank on the call today. I had many fabulous conversations with Alex and Kerry, where there was an exchange that happened between us and I took ideas away. And I hope they took ideas away from myself. And then we use that exchange of knowledge and these sessions that we, we deliver through the business in the community or the Equality Commission is all about sharing our journey and our lessons learned. So don't be afraid to be at the start of your journey. It's a great place to be because you have so many companies ahead of you in Northern Ireland that can share their knowledge, share their experiences, share the things you do not do, share the things you do. And that will probably save you money. It will save you time. And it will save you a lot of heartache around hurting people. Because we, we had lessons that we had to learn through hurting ourselves. Um, maybe people got hurt because we didn't communicate the things the way we intended to. But the intention is always coming from our best interest in a positive place in our hearts. So we're at our meet and intermediate place at the minute. And we have a long way to go. Um, we have all these groups and currently what we're facing during the pandemic, we lost a lot of our members, everything from Zoom fatigue to not having them face to face in the office to people's values and beliefs changing and they maybe don't want to spend any more time with the employee resource group. So there's different factors why we lost people. A couple of our employee resource groups were practically down to maybe three, four members or maybe even one. So what we're focusing on this year is rebuild, build back up all of our employee resource groups, build up the engagement and bring people back in the office, bring people back into face-to-face -face events and be more intentional, focus on the quality instead of quantity. So stop delivering um, too many sessions, but, and also we're focusing on um, intersectionality. So we're partner up, different employee resource groups are partnering up on different topics. Prime example, we um, delivered a session a couple of months ago where our gender group GROW in Northern Ireland partnered up with our Pride Network. And we delivered a session around parenting and around um, gender neutral language. Or So we're partner up with different um, groups um, our Black Employee Network partnered up with our Hispanic Network. So different links and we'll build on the um, engagement and the audience through intersectionality. Because let's be realistic, nobody can fit into one group and that's you, that's where you have to go. You can go to any of any of the groups and we do encourage our employees to, to there's no, you don't have to join just one or you can join one or you can join them all or you can don't join any of them. And you can just attend events. So there's no um, prescription that you need to put yourself into a box to be part of something. So that's what I have. And I am very, very happy to take questions. Um, okay. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Hopefully I didn't. Um, and that was me. I hey, Gina, my, yes, that, that was great. Thank you very much. And you're bang on time virtually there so that's, that's i hope also so i've brilliant. seen the message Every, popping up no oh, you're oh. okay you're fine and thank you very much for that contribution and um and that's what it gives you when we were planning this roisin and um stephanie and, and myself uh we wanted to give you a flavor of different employers um and and their experiences so hopefully we've done that in this and just a point that come up when i think Adriana was talking um about dealing with race in Northern Ireland, what we have found in the Equality Commission is that race, um, dealing with race in Northern Ireland is not always the same as dealing with race, say, in Britain, um, because we have we have a different race history here in the sense that a lot of people in Northern Ireland never considered race an issue here. Uh, and in fact, that's why our legislation came in 20 years later than in Britain, 
So there's sometimes there's a much less awareness at times of race and the, the, the racism that exists in Northern Ireland than there might be in GB. So there's it's another issue to, to, to consider. But thanks again, Adriana. And um, we're going to move on to our final employer speakers. And uh, they're from Danske, Danske Bank. And we have two speakers. We've got Kerry Phillips and Alex uh, Dale Noreen and Alex uh, and Kerry are going to talk about the, the Danska experience in terms of signing up to the BATC Charter. It's fit within their overall diversity and inclusion uh, strategy and work. And they're going to touch again on the, the issue that um, Adriana raised, really important issue of intersectionality. Um, and again, they'll be here. Alex may not be able to stay for the questions, but Kerry will. So I'm going to hand over to uh kelly and um sorry carrie and alex so off you go thank you thank you very much so i will kick off and then hand over to alex so i'm Kerry phillips and i'm the diversity and inclusion partner at danske bank so i'm going to start by sharing a brief overview of our dni architecture at danske and then alex will talk to how origins fits into that and a little bit about our race at work charter so our four networks are an integral part of our DNI strategy. And again, similar to what we, we heard from Sinsata, they are made up with cross deeper mental groups of colleagues who have shared passions and interests and they want to create a better shared future. DNI at Danska is strategic. It is rooted in governance and it aligns to our organizational objectives. And each of our networks have got executive sponsorship. But really, really importantly, DNI at Danska is rooted in intersectionality. And for anybody in the call who doesn't know what that is, it's defined as the overlapping and connected nature of personal characteristics. And then we look at how this might create an overlap and connected experience of discrimination. And for us to be a truly inclusive organization in what we do, we look to the importance of ethnicity within intersectionality. And I'm going to example this through a recent piece of work that we delivered on the menopause. We can move on to our next slide. Thank you. So anybody can be affected by hormonal changes during their lives, and that can be for a number of reasons. And that might be pregnancy or fertility, gender transitioning, uh, conditions requiring hormone treatment and the menopause. These can bring about symptoms which can affect the colleague at work and our new policy focuses on the menopause. And so I know we're here to talk about race and you may not naturally or intuitively connect racial equality to the menopause. But through delivering this piece of work in collaboration with each of our affinity networks, including Origins, our race equality network, we're able to support our colleagues' well-being at every stage of their lives and within each layer of our colleagues' identities, including those who are from an ethnic minority community and those who are experiencing menopause symptoms. So collaboration is crucial in intersectionality and building those formal connections between our groups is vital to our success. And it's really important for me to be clear that our intersectional and collaborative approach to DNI is in addition to the work that already happens. So each of our networks have a very single and a clear purpose, like Origins and the other three, um, and intersectionality does not override our current initiatives. But instead, what we do is strengthen our work streams, our networks, strengthen our shared purpose, and look at the reality of our colleagues. So if we could move on to our last slide. Thank you. So initially, whenever we think of who is impacted by the menopause, we often think of the links to gender and probably women. And this is correct. But in addition, there are many different factors and personal circumstances that may affect how somebody experiences the menopause, including ethnicity, which we usually and often can overlook. So you can see examples on your screen that illustrate how certain groups of people may be adversely affected by the menopause such as possibly being transgender, a man, your sexual orientation, being a woman, having health conditions, a disability, and being from an ethnic minority community. So looking specifically at how ethnicity and the menopause work together, some research has found that there is a variation in the average age at which the menopause takes place between individuals from different ethnic backgrounds. Reporting of the most common and significant symptoms of the menopause have also been found to vary amongst our ethnic groups. However, it is unclear to what extent these differences are caused by potentially our social, our economic, um, language and cultural factors. Again, people who do not have English as their first language or with diverse cultural backgrounds may have more difficulties in communicating their symptoms. 
as many cultures do not have a term which recognizes the menopause. In work, this may make it more difficult for them to access medical advice or help for adjustments in the workplace. And finally, racism can increase work-related stressors, which also may worsen our menopausal symptoms. And so our list is not exhaustive, but what it does do is give our people leaders and our colleagues an idea of the types of issues that they should be considering whenever we are looking at supporting our team members who could be experiencing ethnic disadvantages. So, I mean, to, to close my point, if you think about somebody who is from an ethnic minority community um, and we ask ourselves, well, what support do they need at work? Then next, I would ask you to think about somebody who is experiencing the menopause and what support do they need at work? But neither of these experiences are the reality of our colleagues. And we all have many layers to our identity. So whenever we think about somebody who is from an ethnic minority community and experiencing the menopause, whenever we combine these in our intersectional approach, uh, the experiences and the disadvantages that they're having are likely to look entirely different. So for us, focusing on ethnic diversities as part of a collaborative and our intersectional approach entirely changes how we see things. And this is a perfect example of how so. And that is all from me. And I would love to pass over to Alex to talk to um, our origins network and our experiences of signing the charter. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Catherine, if we could just change the slide there. Thank you. So hello everyone, um, I'm Alex and I also work for Danske Bank. I work in our finance department at the moment, but I also chair our race quality network origins. So I'm just gonna touch on a couple of the points there on the slide and just kind of build them out a bit. So with regards to why did we sign the charter? Well, for us, it really helped with starting the conversation. I remember we signed the charter and we were very early in our race equality journey and it was quite daunting and it was uncomfortable. But I think what's really important about when you sign the charter is you need to know that it's going to be scary and it is going to be uncomfortable, but you need to become comfortable being uncomfortable. The charter also helped us to drive progress. It provided a clear steer for us and direction, which was welcome for us as beginners in this space. And it also provided accountability, allowed us to work with integrity and focused us on clear goals. So I wanted to touch on then, what have we done since signing the charter? So there are a couple of points here that I've called out and we've actually worked on a couple more as well, but conscious of time. So we appointed an executive sponsor for race, Liam Curran, and he helps to provide visible leadership on race and ethnicity in Danska. We've also done work to support race inclusion allies in the workplace. And we did this by hosting an educational webinar and producing a guide for, to assist those colleagues who are allies with race language fluency and having conversations about race in the workplace. We've also committed at board level to zero tolerance of harassment and bullying um, with a focus on our frontline colleagues, those are the ones that work in our branches or answer the phones in like our customer direct, making sure that they know that the bank is behind them and that we do not tolerate discrimination of any kind. And we're also very early into capturing our ethnicity data. So we've initially begun that through our diversity data scheme. Um, and it's something that we think will provide us with a baseline and allow us to see how we're progressing in our race journey. Then challenges that we face. So <laughs> race equality is an ever evolving space and it can be quite difficult to navigate it. It's a fast paced area. There are new terms, new topics, new events that come out all the time. So it's really, we need to enable ourselves to be on top of it. And I always say, you need to continue researching. I mean, I am the chair of the network, but I don't know everything. And I'm constantly watching documentaries or reading online about different things people are talking about, just trying to educate myself as well, because I don't know everything. And you also need to be just open about this conversation and, and be realistic with people. You know, it's important that you're clear about your goals and why you're doing this. And as long as you're honest with people, then that's the best way you can be. And then finally, we're still very early on our race quality journey. And I think like we've learned a lot and we've done made a lot of changes, but there's still lots of learnings to go and a lot of tangible changes to be actioned. So we always ask for feedback from colleagues if they're in the network, if they're out of the network. We speak to other experts. I know Adriana mentioned that we have a conversation with her um, just to touch base with people, see what they're working on, get suggestions and guidance. We're not experts yet, but we hope one day we might be closer to being one. Thank you.
thanks, Alex, and thanks, Kerry. Uh, that was very interesting. I think I think it's it's very interesting to hear uh, actually for all of those companies, all of your companies, um, that there are financial reasons for doing race. You know, I mean, those of us in the Equality Commission for years of, I suppose, it's the moral imperative behind race that's driven us uh, very much and obviously the law and so forth just interestingly before i move on there's a there was a question there to uh carrie and alex as to whether you could share your training materials uh generally that you use for training your staff so that's maybe something for carrie and alex to, to think about but again thanks to both of you and carrie will be staying uh for um the questions stage so you can you can pose any questions you have um so our next so thanks again Kerry thanks Alex our next speaker is uh, from um my own organization uh, and a colleague of mine it's Roisin uh, Kelly and Roisin's going to talk about um from a commission perspective building an inclusive workplace and tell you about um, some of the guidance that we have recently produced to help employers do that. I would just briefly mention, as I said at the start, we are developing our race equality, sorry, race employment plan, and uh, we will be issuing that within the next two weeks. So over to Roisin. Thank you very much, Paul, and good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Roisin Kelly. I'm one of the trainers here with the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland. Uh, and we are delighted to um, be involved in today's event. We think it's really, really important. Um, and we're really um, glad to have the opportunity to work alongside our colleagues in business in the community, uh, as well as such an excellent range of employer speakers uh, attending today. And I suppose on behalf of the Commission, um, you know, uh, and my own colleagues, you know, we're really, really pleased to see so much excellent ongoing work in this area. Um, I want to talk briefly, as Paul said, just in terms of how we can support you within the Commission. Um, we have lots of um, support in terms of our advisory services, and I'm really just going to briefly cover the main ones now. Um, so as you can see on screen there, this is a publication um, which we worked uh, on very recently with colleagues from the Labour Relations Agency. Uh, so this is uh, essentially a guide for employers uh, and it is aimed at providing you with tools and assistance in terms of promoting an inclusive workplace. Um, so essentially this is available as an online document and an online tool. Uh, it's on our website. It's also on the Labour Relations Agency's website, so you can you can have a link to that. But just to tell you really briefly about what we feel the benefit of the guidance is. So essentially, it breaks down the process of building and creating uh, an inclusive working environment for your staff into, uh, I suppose, a number of key practical steps. Okay, that we recommend that you can take. So we've set it out that way deliberately, um, I suppose, for clarity and for ease of reference for you. Um, so if you look at the document uh, following on from today, you will see that each step is really further broken down um, for you. And it links to things like sources of further information that we feel be really, really beneficial for you. Uh, and those are, are linked throughout the document. So essentially, there is a whole host of additional supplementary information, which we hope uh, will help you and will um, you know, do a lot of this work for you. Um, and assist you in terms of getting it right. Um, so you can dip in and out of that as and when you need to, uh, and you can click on the links within the guide. So the, the process is essentially broken down, as you will see, into uh, a number of key steps for you as employers, uh, and those are very practical, uh, and it's done in that way for ease of reference. So essentially, the guide aims to cover um, the issues as briefly and as succinctly as possible, because we do recognise um, you know, that in today's workplaces, employers do need the information to be set out in this way and to be very accessible for them. Um, I will mention, and you'll see mentioned in the guide and some other really useful supplementary information, things like uh, those practical documents that you will need, such as your model policy. Um, there will be things like uh, practical guidance from the Labour Relations Agency in terms of conducting those uh, employment investigations around issues of bullying and harassment at work. 
um, the things like the codes of practice on discipline and grievance procedures, all of that is linked very clearly in the document and they will be at your fingerprint, uh, at your fingertips. Um, so the guide is written as a checklist um, and it's designed essentially to support you through every stage of this process. Okay, if you could move on to the next slide, please, Stephanie. Okay, I want to mention briefly some research that we undertook recently, our research colleagues here in the Commission. You may have seen this already, uh, and full details of the research findings are available on our website. Um, but essentially, um, this was carried out relatively recently in 2019. And essentially, the research points to the fact that in terms of creating inclusive workplaces, employers in Northern Ireland still have a way to go. Uh, and more work to do in terms of developing, creating and maintaining those workplaces in which, you know, their staff feel that uh, the culture is one of inclusivity. And um, so essentially what, what we did was we um, carried out two information gathering exercises, uh, essentially asking both employers and employees, both public and private sector in Northern Ireland to complete a series of online surveys. So the survey was undertaken by 3,500, just over 3,500 employees. And you can see that our headline findings are set out on the slide. Okay, so 69% of those surveyed said that they feel their, their workplace is welcoming and inclusive. Okay, so just over 30% do not. Okay, so a significant shortfall there. 21% um, of those surveyed said that they had personally experienced uh, harassment or unwanted behaviour in the last 12 months. So uh, one, one fifth of those surveyed. And, and by unwanted behaviour, we specifically stated uh, we were referring to harassment on the, uh, under the equality legislation, so on protected grounds. Okay. 25% um, of those surveyed said that they have witnessed unwanted behaviour towards others during the last 12 months, okay? And also we felt that it was really, really important to acknowledge um, the impact of that really on the working environment, um, you know, for those who witness unwanted behaviour and the, the role that employees, uh, employers, sorry, have in terms of ensuring that staff understand their responsibilities in terms of challenging and also reporting behaviour um, uh, that is unlawful. Um, and, and how they go about doing that and that they feel comfortable about doing that. And that's what a lot of this work uh, is, is aimed at as well. So it's clear from the research that the that employers in Northern Ireland, you know, they, they are doing a lot of good work. And we can see that very clearly. There is still work to do. And we in the Commission are committed to working with employers on an ongoing basis uh, to supporting employers um, with uh, all of the work that we do to get in it right um, and making their their workplaces more welcoming and inclusive for everyone. Okay. And I want to mention very briefly before I go on, um, you know, how we define an inclusive workplace. Uh, and it's essentially one where all of your employees feel welcomed. Uh, they have a sense of being valued and they have a sense of being uh, respected and valued throughout the course of their employment with yourselves. And the guidance really drills down, I think this is really, really important, um, into, I suppose, the key elements that must be present in order for employers to get it right. So it talks about things like the role of your line managers, okay? And that's been mentioned already today. Um, you know, it's really crucial that managers and supervisors and anybody in those types of roles are fully equipped with the knowledge and skills um, to not only recognize, but to also challenge these uh, unwanted behaviors in the workplace, okay? And that they actually understand their role in implementing policies. And that's something that has come up uh, again and again in cases that we have seen, and um, because it's crucial to getting it right in this area. The guidance states, that in such an environment, staff should be made aware of not only their responsibilities under it, but also their rights uh, and also the consequences of engaging in such behaviour. Okay, it's crucial that employees feel confident 
that they can raise issues, okay, and that issues will be dealt with promptly, seriously, and confidentially. Uh, it's about the culture in the organisation, and it's about dealing with issues uh, in a way that encourages others um, that, and that others are confident that they can come forward. So if you could move on to the next slide, um, you can see here the six steps to creating an inclusive workplace. Um, I'm not going to go through them in detail um, during today's webinar, but what I would say to you is, is that we run separate sessions where we go, we drill down um, into more detail uh, into each step. And there's more detail given in all of our guidance. Um, and, and as I've said, all of our, our supplementary information, our model policies, our codes of practice, um, they're all linked there and they're aimed at helping you. Um, but central to it, it, it's about getting it right. It's about your communication. It's all of the work that's been mentioned today. Um, it's about promoting a zero tolerance culture for everybody um, and sending out a clear message that, you know, the commitments that we have set out in our policies um, are actually uh, implemented on an ongoing basis in practice. OK, so if you could move on, um, please, Stephanie. Uh, and I want to mention just before I finish, so uh, this this is um, an audit tool, essentially, that comes from a, a document called the Unified Guide to Promoting Equality of Opportunity in Employment, okay? Um, and it's, I suppose, it's a really, really useful supplementary handbook for employers, which you can use in conjunction with the guidance that I've mentioned already today. And because there's a lot more detail there, okay? So you'll find information there on things like recruitment, disability and the reasonable adjustment duty, um, everything in terms of promoting a good and harmonious and good environment. All of our model policies are there. Uh, the advice around the legislation and the associated practical implications for you as employers. So what I'm saying in a nutshell is um, all of the information that I've referred to this morning is, is accessible on our website. And uh, if you could move on to the final slide, please, Stephanie. Um, we are more than happy to work with you um, through our various um, uh, support mechanisms. So the likes of our employer training program, where we go into these issues in a lot more detail, uh, our one-to-one -one, uh, support service through our advice line. Um, so please contact us after today and uh, you know, be, we'd be very, very happy to work with you. And thank you for your time this morning. Thanks, Roshi. And um, just to mention uh, uh, that the advice and the guidance there that Roshi talked about, that's all been brought into one place for you now in our equality plan. So. Um, if you decide to develop a race plan, uh, all of that guidance is pulled together in one place to make it easier for you then. I would just briefly mention as well on um, the research, it, also the research showed significant evidence of conscious and particularly unconscious bias with regard to race in Northern Ireland. That's another thing to be cognizant of as well, that it's not just conscious bias that you know causes racism or results in racism here. So. We're going to move on to our final speaker, and that's our colleague Stephanie from BITC. We do have a number of questions, which uh, we'll have to go over uh, our allotted 60 minutes, So, uh, but uh, that's worth it in terms of the questions that have been asked. So we'll listen to Stephanie, and then we'll move into Q&A, and you're very welcome to stay beyond um, 11. And OK, over to Stephanie, and uh, away you go, Stephanie. Thank you, Paul. Good morning, everybody. Yes, I'm conscious of time, so I will be as brief as I can and maybe cut a little bit out um, but I'll get over my key points. So I'm going to spend hopefully just about five minutes sharing some thoughts and ideas on support mechanisms that you could consider implementing within your organisation to help promote race equality. The three support mechanisms that I'm going to touch on include allyship, reverse mentoring and um, employee networks. Now we've heard from our speakers on these this morning. So, like I said, I'm going to be very brief, um, but please do get in touch with me following the session if you would like to explore these in, in more detail. So, as we've already talked about this morning, it's important as an employer to provide the necessary support for inclusion to allies to promote race equality in teams at work and within their communities. And allyship is critical to fostering an inclusive workplace culture. So, allyship means acknowledging that. There's a whole set of experiences that are pressing and painful for many people in your organisation that you may have no awareness about. And being a good ally 
means that you accept the privilege majority groups have in a professional setting and you use it to help break down systems, keeping your co-workers from having the same opportunities. And it's up to people who hold positions of privilege to be active allies to those with less access and to take responsibility for making changes that will help others to be successful. Now, supporting race um, inclusion allies in the workplace is principle six of the Race at Work Charter and we at Business in the Community are available to help and guide you through this charter um, with signposting and resources. So please do get in touch if you think that we could um, help with embracing the charter within your organisation. And just some of the practical ways that employers can support allies um, is to provide safe spaces to, to share challenges, good practice ideas and stories, provide support for allies with guidelines on active bystander actions and, and, and interventions, and provide clear policy guidance, setting out your organization's commitment to listen, to support and, and to act to enable allies to increase their impact and effectiveness. So I'm going to very quickly move on um, to the next support mechanism, um, two-way mentoring. So as a business, we've heard this morning, investing in communities of colour at work is a crucial step in creating equality in the workplace. And this can be done through inclusive programmes like mentorship. Now, access to mentorship and sponsorship has reduced for Black and minority ethnic communities since 2018. So we're calling on leaders and employers to engage in two-way mentoring models and active sponsorship. So two-way mentoring, mutual mentoring, reverse mentoring, whatever you call it within your organisation, it can be such a powerful strategy to lower barriers to progression for people from underrepresented ethnicities. Um, it can widen access to networks and it can be as simple as inviting a mentee to a meeting that they would not have been able to attend or offering an assignment that they're ready to take on and, and demonstrate some new skills. Mentorship builds up a network um, and it opens doors to new relationships that can really influence someone's career and this relationship helps navigate the workplace and influence important career moments like promotions. Now most importantly it provides a support system and coaching outside of a direct manager and is really invaluable and mentorship is a two way street. So it doesn't only benefit the mentee, but also the mentor by helping them better understand the experiences of employees and it adds to their leadership experience. So just very quickly four keeps key steps to success, make sure to set the purpose set the intentions, set the membership parameters and expectations of participants. So map out the topics, the expectations and the outcomes to ensure that everybody's on the same page. Train the participants so that all parties understand the relationship and provide support for the relationships to ensure that both parties have the tools, the time and support needed to make it a success. You could also consider providing some suggested conversation topics um, such as, you know, what's new in the company, what's going on, um, talking about lived experience or talking about how it feels to work um, in the company as a person from an ethnic minority background. Essentially, it's important that any mentoring programme is supported by the leadership, the culture, the processes and the practices within your organisation. So this really requires effective consideration, support and governance, but this will ensure that challenges are identified and rectified and consistent support is provided for all parties involved. And finally, employee networks. We've heard a lot about employee networks this morning and heard some really good examples. Um, you may also know these as employee resource groups or affinity groups, but the important thing for you to take away today is that they're voluntary and they're employee led groups. <clears throat> The importance of employee networks and staff feeling supported at work, um, I don't think can be overstated. And establishing an employee network that focuses on race and ethnicity can play a key role in encouraging and supporting all employees to bring their whole self to work. And it can contribute to creating inclusive environments and building a sense of community. And they can really help to facilitate employee engagement and meaningful dialogue about diversity and inclusion at work. So I was going to go through some of the benefits, but we're tied on time, so I'm going to cut it short. But what I would just say about the, about the networks, you know, they're much more effective when their aims fit well with your organisational objectives. So if you would like to speak to a member of business and community about how to start gaining commitment and support to start a network, please do get in touch.